Welcome to Knowledgeable Aging. I'm your host, Jason Kotar. Joining us today to talk about a different perspective on the risk of obesity, obesity-related challenges in the acute care setting is Dr. Asante Dixon. Dr. Dixon is chairman of Adventist Healthcare White Oak Medical Center and co-founder slash president of Ascension Medical Educators, a professional services firm committed to providing quality academic advising, professional development, and positive self-assessment of students aspiring to the profession of medicine. Dr. Dixon is a graduate of Cornell University, a former post-baccalaureate student at Georgetown University in the Georgetown Experimental Medical Studies Program. He is a full-time CAQ neuroradiologist and a committed advocate for social justice and healthcare with significant contribution of time, talent, and finance in support of high school and college level pipeline initiatives for scholars aspiring to the profession of medicine. How are you doing it? How are you doing today, Dr. Dixon? I'm doing great, Jason. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, sir. Uh, so we are going to switch things up a little bit today. Instead of taking questions at the end to make best use of our time, I'd like to address some of the topics up front that I know the public is interested in. Some of these topics are, is obesity in the United States really a problem or is it overblown? Does obesity discrimination exist in the hospital? Is the answer to just make machines and tables bigger? How exactly can obesity affect the diagnosis and treatment of disease in the hospital setting? And do we know if COVID affects people differently based on weight? Dr. Dixon, I'll turn it over to you, sir. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, welcome everybody who's on the uh, WebEx and webinar. I know there's some people internationally watching uh, from Canada, uh, Costa Rica, Colombia, and Brazil. Uh, welcome to everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon to those uh, down south. Um, so let's address some of the questions that you've asked and address overall obesity in the acute care setting. And what we mean by that is the hospital. Let's talk about hospital care and obesity. All right. Um, what is obesity? So we have a wide variety of people watching. You've got physicians, uh, healthcare professionals, and non-healthcare people who are just interested in this lecture. And so therefore, what I've done is I've made the lecture um, less medical intricate, if you will, and let's just have a conversation. So instead of me giving you all kinds of definitions as to what is obesity, you, you take a look at these two pictures. I think those of us particularly looking uh, living in the United States can agree that the gentleman on the left and the lady on the right are obese. If you're sitting in a chair and your flanks uh, or your lateral wings are pushing on to the next person, you're likely large. Right on the right, that looks like a turnstile in the New York City subway. And that looks like somebody, in order for her to get through there, she's likely going to have to turn or oblique herself, or she's going to rub, okay? So if you're a rubber, okay, you're likely meeting the standard of obesity, all right? And you can make whatever definition you want, honestly, but as far as all of us are concerned, we have a huge problem with obesity here in this country. The United States is now reaching greater, greater than 40% obesity. That means that 40% or greater of the population here in the US is obese. And for some of my Colombian and Brazilian colleagues, I compare to your countries in which Colombia is rated at about 22.3% and Brazil is about 22.10%. Now, that's not great either, but that also shines a lot of light on the United States. But let's put it internationally. Let's kind of look, what does the world of obesity look like? So briefly, if we look at this map of the, of the world, uh, red are areas in which 40% or greater of the population is considered obese. Gray and lower to the left is considered either zero or less than 10%. The United States and Mexico and Venezuela seem to be uh, running very well in the Western Hemisphere. And interestingly, if you look in the African continent, you've got South Africa and Egypt into, and uh, over into Saudi Arabia, 
and then look further east and look at the Pacific Islanders. The Pacific Islanders are probably the most obese people in the world, statistically. All right. But if you look at Brazil and you look at Colombia, uh, they're kind of obese ish. Right. But this is all relative to population. But take a look at any country here that you may be interested in. And you can see that obesity is a worldwide problem. It's not just at KFC here in the United States. Hospital bias. Is this a real thing? Um, so let's have an honest conversation. What is bias? Bias is not something that the hospital does. It's something that is transferred onto colleagues and patients by people. And if people are biased, then you can have instances in the hospital in which patients will be discriminated against based on their size. That's being honest, right? So there have been many examples in which uh, we may get a consult in interventional radiology, for example, and they'll say we need uh, to see this patient because they have X and Y, Z, X, Y, Z problem. And somebody on the staff may say, this patient's a big one, right? So once we hear that, already have determined that there may be some challenges to whatever procedure or consultation we may be asked to provide, right? That language occurs in the hospital all the time. Some of this, some of it is just purely individual bias. Um, and some of it is honestly, as you'll see through the, the, the talk, it's important to know because it'll affect the way we treat and our ability to treat that patient, right? So this person sitting here on the couch, if I look at this individual, I already know that I'm gonna have major challenges in the treatment of this individual just because of their body habits. You see the low lying belly going between the legs. You look at the size of the person's calves and the size of their feet, right? And even some of the skin changes going on in the shin and the calf, I already know that this is a challenging patient. Why so? Let's talk about how we are challenged in the acute care setting and therefore how you, as a person who may be struggling with obesity, will in turn be challenged with meeting successful treatment goals. The first thing is, we deal with a lot of delays when we have to get transportation for patients that are large. In the hospital setting, it's our responsibility to keep the patient safe at all times. So something as simple as finding a wheelchair that may be large enough to fit a person can delay your care, okay? If you can't get in the wheelchair and you need assistance, that can delay your care. If you look to the bottom right, you see it may require more than one or two people to help larger people move from bed to table and vice versa, right? And that requires a delay because now we have to call out and ask for help. We need lifting help in room six, lifting help in IR suite four. You have to lay there longer because now we need more people to help you move. The young lady in the middle, uh, is doing a poor job of demonstrating how much pain she's in, but we get the idea. We have injuries to a lot of staff because we're constantly lifting heavier and heavier patients here in the United States. Access. Now, as a radiologist and as somebody who does a lot of interventional work, access, access, access. When you come into the hospital, whether you're mildly sick, moderately sick, or severely ill, you're likely, to get, you're likely going to be receiving some sort of intravenous fluid, uh, and therefore you're gonna need access. The larger you are is the harder it is to obtain that access, okay? If you look to the arm to the left, that looks like a relatively reasonable arm size where I can see some of the veins in the hands. The arm, the arm to the right looks like a relatively decent arm size where we should be able to reasonably get access. But as you get larger, our ability to access you becomes more difficult. If you look to the left, we often use landmarks. So when you turn your neck 
we are using landmarks anatomically to determine where we think your vessel should be running. The larger you are, the harder it is for us to identify these landmarks. If you look to the far right, what you're looking at is you're looking at somebody's groin. So the blue towel is draped over their groin and the needle is being accessed into, or we're trying to achieve access into one of the arteries of the veins. Now, why is this important? Medications are administered this way. Fluid is administered this way, okay? And even uh, blood pressures can be obtained through this way. If we're having difficulty or we're having a complex procedure where we need to get a more accurate blood pressure. I ask everybody listening right now, I want you to feel your neck, okay? And turn your neck to the side. And you need to ask yourself, if somebody needed to emergently get a catheter or IV in you to save your life, to give you life-saving medication, would they have difficulty feeling your anatomy in order to determine where that catheter needs to go? You can imagine the shorter your neck is, the thicker your neck is, the bigger your face is, the closer your jaw is to your shoulder, is the more trouble we're going to have accessing you. I can remember as a medical student, I'll never forget, a patient that came in as a nurse from a nearby institution and she needed immediate airway management because she had asthma and her airway shut down. And I watched as a medical student, the ER doctors frantically try to put an IV in her neck or in her groin and couldn't achieve access because she was so large, nobody could find anything. Here are some of the things that obesity brings in the hospital. Over consultation. What does that mean? There are different doctors in the hospital of different specialties. You may come in with a relatively straightforward and a relatively simple issue, but because of all of your comorbid factors that come along with obesity at times, such as high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, kidney disease, now we're asking more and more doctors to come help us manage you. So instead of you just coming into the emergency room and having the emergency doctor manage you, now you've got the nephrologist or the kidney doctor, the cardiologist is coming in to help. Everybody is being called to help because of your existing uh, comorbid factors. Not to mention you're adding to the cost of your care because each one of those doctors is going to add a bill. <laughs> All right, here's a good way to understand what is fat distribution? So if you look to the left, what I've done, for those of you not familiar with imaging, is I'm showing you three images through people's livers. So think of it as I've cut through the person's abdomen like a loaf of bread, like, like a loaf of bread. And I've taken that loaf and I flipped it up on the side. So you're looking at the person's front, back, right, and left over here. If you look to the left, you can see there's minimal fat around the ribs, okay? So that means when you push on that individual, you're feeling ribs underneath them. That person is relatively bony, right? The person in the middle, they've got a little bit of fluff, all right? You can see all of that gray stuff around the perimeter, that's all fat. So the organs are inside and they're surrounded by the fat. That's a typical American body in the middle, which is a decent amount of fat fluff, right? Cushion, as people say. And then to the right, you've got a large amount of that dark gray black around the central structures. That's a lot of fat. So you've got skinny, typical American in the middle, and that's a big person to the right. Now, how can this affect your care? Well, the more fluff you have is not only the more difficult it is for us to get access to certain body parts, but if you look from left to center to right, you'll see that there's more, there are more lines across the image to the far right. That means that the, the, the CT machine itself is actually struggling to see inside of you because it can't see through all of the fluff. 
So what does that mean? That means that you're less likely or rather more likely to have care in which a diagnosis may be missed because we can't see, because mm -hmm. you have a huge amount of fat preventing our visualization of structures and disease. Equipment. Can your knee fit into this brace? More and more, we're finding that we have patients that have broken bones or joints that are injured, and we get a brace or a knee, and we can't fit the patient because the knee or the elbow is too big. If you look to the right, that collar around that gentleman's neck, he probably has either suspicion of a fracture or has a fracture. You need to immobilize that patient. Can your neck fit in a brace? More and more, I see patients with the brace on, and the brace is halfway on and halfway off like a scarf. And I say, why is this patient wearing a scarf brace? Well, it's because the patient's neck is too big for the brace. Medication. All the anesthesiologists out there, they understand this uh, significantly. The larger you are, it's the harder it is to sedate you. It's the harder, it's it, larger people bring huge challenges to being able to optimize sedation. That means pain medication, anxiety medication. The fat is a living, breathing structure. So everybody right now, you feel your fat, wherever your fat is, right? Wherever your fat is, you feel it. That fat is not just there for you to pinch it in the morning before you go to work. That fat is living and breathing. So that means when medications are administered, they're actually circulating within the fat. The larger you are, the more storage of medication you have, which means when you wake up from surgery and you're in pain and they say, all right, give Mr. XYZ more pain medication, there may be challenges because Mr. XYZ already has pain medication circling around in his body. So now you're at risk of over sedating that individual. Significantly, we're seeing that larger patients also, when they stop breathing or they achieve apnea, if they stop breathing for any moment, they don't have the oxygen reserve to be able to keep them fun functioning, oxygenating their blood as well as a smaller person. Intubation, larger tongues, smaller airways, it leads to more difficult uh, intubation or putting tubes down people's throats to help them to breathe. That woman I told you about when I was a med student, she passed, died on that table because the doctors were not able to achieve venous access or put a tube down her throat because her neck was so short and so thick and her tongue was so large, they couldn't see to put the tube down. Died on the table. I'll never forget that. Wound healer. All right, so to the left, that's a nice little approximated wound, right, some staples, it looks nice and pretty, all right? And when these young ladies are cutting you through your belly, the larger you are, it's the more likely that that wound will not heal well, or it won't heal as fast. Or sometimes, like the picture to the lower right, you have dehiscence, which means that the wound sometimes can actually break apart. And once wounds break apart, now you got to worry about infection if that wasn't the cause from the very beginning. Thrombogenic, right? What that means is clots. You hear about people getting DVTs and lung clots, clots in the lung, clots in the lower extremity. The larger you are through the science of, of, uh, of through the science of, of, of clot formation or through God, whatever you want to call it, you're at higher risk to develop thrombus or clots in your legs that go to your lungs and could kill you. COVID and obesity. All right, so we're all dealing with COVID right now. And the one thing, we haven't been able to say this for 100 years. Everybody, no matter where you are listening to this lecture, you are dealing with coronavirus, okay? We are now seeing, particularly here in the United States, that because of our 40% or larger population of obese people, we are having correlations between bad COVID infection outcomes and body size, okay? So why does bigger body size lead to worse COVID sickness? 
Well, there are a couple theories. One is that the larger you are, is the more pro-inflammatory chemicals that your body is creating and circulating because you've got more tissue to circulate it. The more pro-inflammatory chemicals you have, that is telling us that you are not able to process a lot of the foods that you're ingesting, like the fats, the sugars, and the salts. And the American diet, and increasingly the world diet, is full of fast food, fat, sugar, and salt. So if you now get COVID infection, you're less likely to be able to handle that infection because you already have a baseline inefficiency to deal with any metabolic abnormality or infection, okay? When you're large, particularly when larger people lay on their backs, you can see that they may have what we refer to in medicine as increased work of breathing. The harder you have to work to breathe is the less your lungs are gonna move in and out. The less your lungs move in and out is the less you're able to clear infection from your lung. The more you're going to get what's called atelectasis, which is when your lung can't move, it essentially collapses and atelectasis only leads to trouble. That's why after surgery, Every doctor is telling you, Mr. or Mrs. Johnson, or Mr. or Mrs. Ramirez, okay? Move, get up and move, get up and move, okay? The larger you are and the less you're able to move is the higher risk you have of never leaving this hospital. I'll be honest with you. Younger people getting COVID in the United States are seen to be correlated with larger size. This started in, in China and Italy as their COVID surges happened before the US, and now we're seeing it in the United States. Men are also having worse outcomes with COVID than women are being of equal size. And that may be because male fat is more stored in the belly. Female fat is more stored in the hips. Now you can imagine if you're laying on your belly and you have a bad COVID infection and you're on a machine to help you breathe because you can't breathe on your own and your kidneys are failing, the fact that you've got this major abdominal fat mass of living, breathing tissue working against you is not helping. Recent Kaiser Permanente study showed that BMI of 40 or more is considered obese extremely obese, and those individuals have a three times greater risk of dying of COVID disease if they're infected. If you're 45 or greater BMI, you're four times at risk of dying. And men under 60, okay, have shown huge risks of dying when they're obese. By the way, normal BMI is about 18 to 25, and if you're 25 to 30 about, you're considered overweight. So everybody needs to, when they're done with this lecture, you need to check your BMI or ask your doctor to check your BMI and see where you fit. So this COVID obesity correlation is real. And a lot of it is because we already existed as a large society. Now here in the United States, Latino people and black people which a totally different lecture as to what means Latino and black. I always say that, remember, race is an artificial classification, it doesn't really exist in real life, we just make this up. So Latino people and black, we'll just go with what we know, right? If you're black and Latino, then you're even double screwed, right? You're more likely to be obese and you're more likely to have poor access to healthcare and have all of these other diseases. And as a result, you're more likely when you get sick with COVID to have a poor outcome. Simple as that. It's not necessarily because black people and Latino people have genetic predispositions to die from COVID. They're bringing body and health issues that make their COVID infection more efficient, if you will. Lastly, I want to show you that you want to avoid 
essential workers like these two. So the one to the left is the fireman that's gonna have to use his saw and his ax to beat down your wall to get you out because you're eating too much KFC and you can't fit through the door. If you see this gentleman coming to your house to break down your wall or he's taking you out on a crane, you're in trouble. The one on the right, he wants to cut. That's all he wants to do is cut you, right? But you're increasing your risk for complications if you are obese. So thank you so much. I wanted to just uh, speak more on a ground level and not to get too intricate into the medical details because I think all of us need to be more cognizant of what is obesity. It is literally killing us, has been killing us before COVID, and now COVID should, should really raise our flags as to the importance of managing our body habits. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening. It's been a pleasure to be here. Um, anybody wants to reach me, you can reach me at A. Dixon at Adventist Healthcare. That's A D I C K S O N at AdventistHealthcare.com. Also, I'm on Instagram or Twitter at AME Docs, A M E D O C S, or Asante.Dixon at AscendMed.com. That's A S A N T E dot D I C K S O N at a S C E N M as in Mary E D dot com. Thank you so much for the time and opportunity to share some knowledge and some experience with everybody. Well, Dr. Dixon, I want to say thank you, sir, for your time um, and your expertise and your knowledge as well, and look forward to further collaboration down the road. Uh, Till next time, I'm Jason Coates, I'm your host, and this is Knowledgeable Aging. <laughs>